This is going to be an informal introduction to cryptography. We're not going to get into any real math at all. First, we'll look at what's called symmetric or private key encryption, which is the normal kind of encryption one thinks of, wherein a message, a piece of data, is scrambled so as to appear random, and that scrambling process can only be reversed, we can only unscramble, if we have a secret key. Then we'll look at cryptographic hash functions, which are useful for what is called digital fingerprinting. And lastly, we'll look at asymmetric, or public key, encryption, which is encryption that involves two secret keys. You encrypt using one key, and then you decrypt using the other. Hence, asymmetric. And the public key aspect is that one of the keys we can disclose publicly. We don't keep it secret, we actually deliberately publish it to the world. The special utility of this is something we'll explain. First off, some basic terminology. An encryption algorithm is often called a cipher, cipher with a C. The data we encrypt with a cipher is called the plain text, and then what results from the cipher will get spit out, the scrambled form of the data, that is called the cipher text. And do understand that the data to encrypt can be any kind of data. It can just be any arbitrary sequence of bits. It doesn't have to be text. Plain text and cipher text are just the traditional terms, uh, likely stemming from the fact that encryption historically started out being all about securely transmitting text. In any case, uh, in this example here, if we have the plain text reading socket to me exclamation mark, and then we run that through an encryption cipher, we get out a cipher text, which who knows what it looks like, just a bunch of bits, which in ASCII would probably look something like a bunch of garbage characters, maybe something like this. Uh, and then we run that cipher text back through the decryption cipher, and we get back out the plain text. So we get back the original message. So, very importantly, notice that there's no apparent relationship between the ciphertext and the plaintext. If there were any apparent relationship, if there were patterns hinting at what the plaintext was, uh, that would be a weak encryption algorithm. Ideally, the ciphertext should appear to anyone without the key to decrypt the ciphertext. It should appear to be total garbage. It should just look like random noise. Of course, it's not actually random. It's deterministically generated by the encryption algorithm. It just has the appearance of being random because it's so scrambled. Also understand here that in some cases you have encryption algorithms where the decryption process is precisely the same. In other cases though, the encryption process may differ. So in reality, an encryption algorithm may actually uh, be a pair of algorithms, one for the encryption, one for the decryption. Perhaps the simplest cipher round is probably also the oldest, and it's called the Caesar cipher because it was actually used by Julius Caesar. Though extremely simple, it was probably pretty effective at the time because, uh, first off, most people back then couldn't read. Moreover, even amongst those who could read, the very idea of encryption was probably unfamiliar to most. The way the cipher works is you simply substitute each letter of a message with the letter which is some set places down in the alphabet. Uh, Caesar reportedly used a, a rotation of three. So in the English alphabet, a B would be substituted with E, C with F, D with G, E with H, and so forth. And then once you get to the end of the alphabet, what you do is you simply treat it as if the alphabet wraps around. So the letter uh, Z, for example, would substitute with C. And then, of course, to decrypt, you would just do the opposite. You would take your Cs and you'd turn them back into Zs. So assuming some undesired party gets a hold of your ciphertext, if it doesn't occur to them that they're looking at a message encrypted with a Caesar cipher, um, then they'll just dismiss it as a bunch of random garbage. If it does occur to them, though, and they really want to read your message, you're probably screwed, because it's really easy to crack a Caesar cipher. You just really go through all 26 possibilities, because there's only so many rotations uh, that you, you might have used. So the Caesar cipher is not very secure, but it does demonstrate one of the basic principles of many encryption schemes, which is called substitution. You take the basic units of your plain text, in this case letters, and you substitute them according to some table of this gets substituted with that. This same basic mechanism substitution is what's used with secret decoder rings. Each letter is arbitrarily mapped to another letter, or in some cases to numbers, and the recipient just needs an identical decoder ring so they can reverse the substitution. Now, having to use a physical object, a decoder ring, as a key is kind of clumsy because it means you have to distribute these physical objects to all the people who need to communicate with each other. It would be much more convenient if we could base our shared secret on just a short piece of data we can exchange. Uh, in other words, a key. A really simple way of doing substitution based upon a key 
is to line up our secret random key with the start of the alphabet such that here, when our key is ZDXWEJKR, uh, and note for simplicity here, we're just dealing with capital letters, so ignore uh, lowercase letters for now. Here, A gets substituted with Z, B with D, C with X, D with W, and so forth until H with R. And then as for the remaining letters, I through Z, what you do is you just fill in all the remaining letters that weren't included in our key. Uh, you fill them in left to right in sequence. So all the letters we didn't use were A, B, C, F, G, H, I, L, M, N, O, P, Q, S, T, U, V, Y. And so we substitute I with A, J with B, K with C, L with F, M with G, and so forth. So assuming you and I both have settled upon this uh, mechanism for encryption, uh, all I have to do is share with you the random key I've chosen, and then I can send you messages and you can decrypt them with the same random key and you would just build your substitution table just like so. You'd line up the key first with the start of the alphabet and then fill in the remaining letters, and then you get your substitution table. So substitution is a basic and really quite obvious technique of encryption. Uh, another similarly obvious and simple technique is what's called transposition, which is the fancy term for taking the pieces of our plain text and scrambling them around. Not scrambling them randomly, of course, uh, scrambling them in a deterministic fashion that can be reversed but nonetheless scrambling them around. So in the ciphertext, we have the appearance of randomness. Perhaps the simplest kind of transposition is columnar transposition, so-called because it's as if we take our message and write it in a set number of columns. Here are four columns, and then we get our ciphertext by reading down each column. So our plain text, I like zebras, we write that out in four columns, and then we simply read down each column in turn. So we go I, K, E, S, space, E, B, period, L, space, R, space, I, Z, A, space. Note that we got a little bit of distortion because our original plain text didn't have two spaces at the end. The period is the end of the message. We can correct this distortion by simply including with a ciphertext a note of precisely how many characters long our message actually is. That way, when we decrypt, we know that the last two characters, those last two spaces, weren't really part of the message. Now, of course, even when you do this on paper, you don't really have to write out the columns. We can simply start at the beginning of the plain text and skip over every four letters. And once we go past to the end of the message, we just go back to the start, but then start at the next letter over for effectively the next column. Now, of course, while in this case we used four columns, we could use any other number of columns, except, of course, one, which would result in the ciphertext identical to the plain text nor would you want the number of columns equal to the length of the plain text or greater than the plain text, because then again you'd get a ciphertext identical to the plain text. Whatever number of columns we decide to use, that's the key for our message. You and I want to exchange messages and we've agreed to use columnar transposition. The secret key we then share is how many columns. A one-time pad is another simple encryption technique in which we use a key which is as long as the plain text itself. And remember, keys are supposed to be random so that they are unguessable. What we do with the key is combine a character of the key with a corresponding character of the plain text. This combination, though, of course, has to be reversible. So, for example, addition is a good candidate because we can add uh, a character of the plain text to a character of the random key and get out a character of ciphertext. And then to reverse that, we use subtraction we subtract a character of the random key with the corresponding character from the ciphertext, and we get back the corresponding character of plain text. Uh, another good operation to use is an XOR, exclusive OR, which has the handy feature of being its own inverse operation. So we XOR together a character of plain text with the corresponding random key character, and we get out a ciphertext character, and then to reverse we again just use XOR. We XOR a random key character with the corresponding ciphertext character, and we get back a, a plain text character. In either case, if we use addition or an XOR, what we get out is a ciphertext that should actually be perfectly random, or at least as perfectly random as our random key. And in fact, one-time pads are actually the only form of encryption known to be totally secure, at least in theory. As long as the keys used are truly random and they are kept secret, there's really no possible way to crack the code. Unlike with any other encryption technique, there are really no clues left in the ciphertext for a cryptanalyst to analyze and discover some pattern. Aside from the length of the message, or rather the maximum length of the message, there's really no information about the plain text that's carried over into the ciphertext. 
So if one-time pad is perfectly secure in theory, why are they not used in practice? Well, the downside is in having to generate and distribute and keep secret keys which are very, very long. And be very clear that you shouldn't reuse keys. Uh, this is generally the case with most encryption except public key encryption. If an attacker intercepts two messages encrypted with the same key, there are cryptanalysis techniques that can exploit that. So while one-time pads were historically used for high-grade military security, the technique is really not practical for most other uses. Managing and keeping track of and keeping secure your keys is of course extremely important, and generally the shorter the keys, the easier this is to do. Just imagine, say, the hassle if you want to transmit a gigabyte-sized file using a one-time pad. You'd have to generate, store, and distribute a key which is over one gigabyte in size, and that's just not very practical. What's called a stream cipher in the end operates very much like a one-time pad, with the difference that we use a small key, something like 128 bits or 256 bits, something about that size, and from that the stream cipher generates what we call the key stream, which is the actual key we are combining with the plain text to produce our ciphertext, just like we do uh, with a one-time pad. So the big advantage here over the one-time pad is that we are using small keys. The strength of the encryption, though, is not as theoretically secure, because pseudorandom is not the same thing as random. Though a pseudorandom stream of data may appear random, it's not truly random, it's actually deterministically generated from some starting point, in this case the key. The determinism means that yes, there are patterns, the question is how apparent are those patterns, how easy are they to discover with techniques of cryptanalysis. Stream ciphers also share the weakness with one-time pads that they are especially vulnerable to attacks if an attacker gets their hands on two messages encrypted with the same key. So while with symmetric encryption it's always true you want to avoid reusing keys, with stream ciphers it's especially true. Uh, I should note that in some people's use of the terminology, one-time pads are considered a kind of stream cipher, just one in which the key stream is truly randomly generated rather than pseudo-randomly generated.